Why do switches influence the sound quality? Basically, digital audio is rather robust. It gets vulnerable when converting it back to analog. That is where switches, buffers, cables, clock crystals, power supplies and many more have their influence. Ever since I reviewed audiophile switches, I get comments telling me that I don't understand how digital data transfer and networks work. Often from people that have a far better education in that field than I have. So I suppose they are right. But I have repeatedly concluded in listening tests with, for instance, several consumer grade switches, one Cisco Catalyst 2960 switch and several audiophile switches that there was a difference in sound quality between them. The worst sounding ones were the 25 euro consumer grade switches, then the Cisco and the cheaper audiophile ones, while the best ones were the higher end audiophile switches, the ones I kept using. SOTM SNH10G, AccuFox AccuSwitch SE and the Optron Audio Ether Regen. There is only one streamer I know that is completely insensitive to switches, the Grim Audio Mu1 digital player. So do the network specialists have a point? Apart from the fact that most comments were rather rude, I don't think they all own a Grim Audio Mu1 or even have tried one. I suppose they know a lot about digital data transport but not enough about digital audio. And although I have a fair understanding of digital audio, I must admit that my knowledge too was insufficient to understand what was going on. So I needed to do more research, like a good tech journalist and reviewer is supposed to do. My understanding of the phenomenon started while reviewing the Optone Ether Regen switch. Optone Audio founder Alex Crespi sent me a copy of Ether Regen designer John R. Swenson's white paper called Understanding how perturbations on digital signals can affect the sound quality without changing the bits and how these issues are addressed by the Optron Audio Ether Regen. It is now published on the Optron Audio site, a link is in the description below this video in YouTube. Still it took me two years before I felt comfortable making this video. Although being rather open about his theories, Swenson did not publish measurements to support it. This kind of knowledge is primarily available in smaller companies and independent electronics designers that have spent enormous time and effort to acquire their knowledge. In general they have nothing to gain from sharing this knowledge, so I am rather thankful to Swenson and some unmentioned designers that confirmed his finds and were so kind to help me forward. Let me show you once again how digital audio works. I know, I have told this several times already, but a good understanding is needed for what I am about to convey to you. To make it visually easy to understand, I use an unlikely straight piece of sound wave. During recording, the signal is filtered at half the sampling rate for CD, normally 20 kHz anti aliasing filters are used. Then the amplitude. The voltage of the audio signal is measured at regular intervals. For CD that's every one forty-four thousand one hundredths of a second. The data from these measurements can easily be transported and stored on any digital media that is fast enough. I show decimal values, the way we are used to. In digital media only ones and zeros are used since that is the format digital equipment will work with. But well, that's just another way of writing the same information. On playback the media carrier is read and consequently those values are converted to voltages that ideally are analogue to the original in both voltage and time. Now you are made to believe that this results in this staircase like waveform, but that's an error of PR people that did not understand the concept of digital audio. For here again a filter at half the sampling rate is applied, here called the reconstruction filter. Again for CD that will be 20 kHz. That makes the electronics too slow to make those staircases. In fact it makes it slow enough to result in the original waveform, 
in this case the straight line. Knowing this, there are two dimensions where things can go wrong during the conversion. A sample can be rendered with the wrong amplitude and it can be rendered at the wrong time. Already in the mid 80s we were able to measure amplitude errors in DA converters using a hand built battery powered calibrated measurement amplifier, a ditto steep 1 kHz filter and a Commodore 64 for plotting the results. Peter van Willenswaard built the electronics, I took care of setting up the Commodore 64 with an 8 bit ADC. It was the time of the ladder converters with the exception of the Philips TDA 1541 that could be found only in players by Philips and players that used the Philips technology like Marantz and Meridian. At that time no DAC chip achieved the claimed 16 bit resolution due to the lack of precision. For ladder DACs it appeared to be extremely difficult to get the resistors at a low level with intolerance. The four times oversampling Philips DAC shifted that critical amplitude problems partly towards time problems. Today the best DACs have almost 21 bit resolution, limited only by the analog electronics. Measuring resolution of a DAC isn't that difficult anymore if you have a digital audio generator and an analog analyzer having very low self noise. You send the digital code for full scale audio to the DAC and measure the analog for output voltage. You then have the digital generator decrease the code in the digital signal down to zero in 1 dB steps and measure the analog output versus the full scale output. This is a simple job for today's computer controlled measurement equipment. And the output looks like this. On the X axis the digital level in dBFS and on the Y axis the analog output in dB reference to the analog output at full scale. Every level should cross at the same value on both axes. The green line shows the measurement, the red line the deviation from the optimum. Ideally the green line goes straight from the top right corner to the lower left corner. Then the red line is fully horizontal. The important question is how important is linearity for the sound quality? We have measured a Burmester DAC in the 80s that measured poorly but sounded heavily. Over the years I have learned that linearity does usually have very limited effect on the sound quality. If there is a deviation in the DAC chips it's usually far below minus 90 dBFS and often due to noise that might also have a dittering effect. By the way, what analog medium goes down that deep? Very good tape on reel can do at best 70 dBs below 3% distortion level at 400 Hz. Even if you accept some friendly distortion at maximum level, vinyl even has less dynamic range. Still on both media there can be a lot of detail, low distortion, high resolution and so on. In plain English, vinyl can sound extremely good despite the limited dynamic range. What becomes clearer and clearer is the importance of time during digital to analog conversion. We have seen how the analog signal is reconstructed by plotting voltages in time at the same pace as was used during recording. But if there is an irregular timing during conversion, this happens. The reconstructed waveform here in red is no longer the straight line we started with, which is even more clear when I draw a white line behind it. Due to the way our auditory system works, this is clearly audible. Our brain uses the attack, or the lack of it, to analyze the frequencies in the signal. Measurement equipment can't do that. It needs at least one full period of the lowest frequency in the signal. That is why jitter, as we call the deviations from true periodicity of a periodic signal, can destroy the lows. It can also have negative effects on the stereo image, localization, resolution and so on. That makes jitter the biggest enemy of quality digital audio. It's jitter during the digital to analog conversion where, for instance, network switches have their influence. 
but any digital device in the audio chain prior to the digital to the analog conversion can have its influence on jitter. At the same time, and I must stress this, the digital information never gets lost unless the device is defective. Zeros remain zeros and ones remain ones for as long as the signal remains digital. It's during the digital to analog conversion things go wrong. The reason generally being jitter. But where does this jitter come from? One of the causes of jitter is phase noise in the clock oscillator. All digital equipment, including computers used as computers, work with step processes. Those step processes are timed by crystal oscillators, piezoelectric resonators tuned to give a certain frequency. Within computers the timing precision is not critical since the information remains digital. Use the digital to analog conversion inside your computer and you'll hear what low spec crystals do to the sound. Every digital audio device following a digital output of a computer is confronted with this irregular clock signal. If an isogonous connection is used like SPDIF, TOSLINK, AES-EBU or I2S, that jitter is nicely passed on to the next device like the DAC, op sampler or reclocker. That device needs to synchronize to the incoming signal which is usually done by a PLL, a phase lock loop. That can catch the clock of the incoming signal within a certain range. The bigger the range is chosen, the less critical it is on the incoming signal. But it then also passes on the incoming jitter. If a narrow catch range is chosen, jittery signals will cause dropouts and mutes while high quality digital signals are passed on as the low jitter signals they are. These problems play no role in USB audio class 2 and network connections since they are asynchronous. They send packets of bits to the receiving device and wait for a signal to send more. The problem that both asynchronous and isogonous signals can suffer from is contamination of the electrical signal. There are several kinds like ground plane pollution, high frequency noise and the like. Don't forget that the so called digital signal is in fact an analog square wave signal. It will by nature be a less perfect square wave since a perfect square wave requires an unlimited bandwidth. Use a non 75 ohm cable for SPDIF or a non 110 ohm cable for AES EBU and the square wave signal will be more distorted. Again normally no problem as long as the signal stays digital. But during the digital to analog conversions things will go wrong since distortion of the square wave can cause jitter. Let's have a closer look at the square waves that carry the digital information. In a near ideal situation a 2 volt square wave will look like this. As you can see both the upgoing line and the near going line are not straight. It takes some time to go from 0 volts to 2 volts and back. That time is called ramp up time and ramp down time. To decide whether the signal represents a 1 or a 0, a so called flip flop is used, an electronic equivalent of a toggle switch. It looks at the incoming voltage of the square waves and when the voltage is below half the total voltage, 0.5 volts in this case, it is considered to be a zero. When the voltage is above 0.5 volts, it's a one. The 0.5 volts level is called the threshold. Now what happens if the clock signal is not stable due to phase noise of the clock oscillator? Simply put, some square waves will be late, others will be early while some will be on time. If a single frequency interferes with the clock signal, it will look like this in slow motion. The correct timing would be at these yellow lines, but with the early square waves it would be here and on the late square waves it would be here. The same goes for the ramp down time of course. If we now look at the graph I use to explain how digital works and introduce these timing problems, you see that the reconstructed waveform is distorted. It's even better visible when the original waveform is put behind it in white. It might be clear 
that this animation portrays a sampling rate, modulated with a single other frequency. In practice there will be several frequencies or noise making the distortion rather complex to draw and comprehend. Furthermore, the frequency of the interfering signal also plays a role. The lower the frequency, the bigger the effect on the sound quality. And then there is the phenomenon of the shifting threshold. There is a second phenomenon that shifts the time samples are plotted. I have defined the threshold in previous examples at 0.5 volts, but 0.5 volts is only 0.5 volts when measured against a ground plane. If that ground plane is polluted by noise or current leaking from the power supply by, say, 0.1 volt, the threshold will shift upwards 0.1 volt, becoming 0.6 volts and you see change state point shift to a later moment. If that 0.1 volt would be constant, it would retard the change state during the ramp up time and advance the change state during ramp down. And there is yet another problem when that 0.1 volt would vary, for instance if a 50 or 60 Hz line frequency leaks through. For then the threshold would constantly vary between 0.5 and 0.6 volts, and thus the timing would vary accordingly. And we are still not complete, for when a flip flop changes state there is a short increased current flow between the power and the ground plane, shortly changing the voltage thus the threshold and the timing of the conversion. In the title of this video I mentioned the switch influencing the sound quality. That can be caused by phase noise of the oscillator in the switch, ground plane noise and other phenomena I mentioned. These all can influence other devices in the digital audio chain, like digital to digital converters, scalers, reclockers, reshapers, digital transports, network players and so on. They can also influence the input circuit of the DAC. And it all can add up. Therefore be careful with jitter remedies, especially the cheaper ones might improve on phase noise but introduce other nasties I mentioned. There are devices that can filter out high frequency noise and that can be beneficial in some cases. There are transformers that offer galvanic separation that blocks DC and low source impedance leakages, but don't block high source impedance AC leakage. There are solutions that can have a positive influence on the sound quality, like quality switches. The Cisco Catalyst WSC2960 8TC S 100 Mbit switch I bought second hand sounds a lot better than the 25 Euro domestic switch and still can be found second hand online for little money. Even better are higher end audiophile switches. I use the SOTM SNH 10G in my setup 1 since it has sufficient ports for the other equipment like TV, set top box, Blu-ray, AV receiver, Apple TV, Raspberry Pi with 7 inch touchscreen that shows what is played by room and so on. For my setup 1 the switch isn't relevant. The Grim Audio Mu1 digital player has solved these problems internally. It makes no difference which switch is used with it. Only when reviewing other equipment the SOTM is relevant and then often followed up with the network acoustics Mu1 streaming system. Upstairs I use the Upton Audio Ether Regen for setup 2. Both switches are connected to the main switch over fiber network. The third switch I now use as a spare since it has no SFP cage for fiber is the AccuFox AccuSwitch SE. All three reduce the pollution of the square waves that transport digital information. Again the digital information would have survived with any switch but during the digital to analog conversion the pollution does have a negative effect on the sound quality. I will end this video by speaking out the hope this explanation will bring a bit more understanding in this field. I will be back next Friday at 5 pm Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this channel or follow me on the social media so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or link to this video on the social media. 
it is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially, especially in these times. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on thehbproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.